Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 29. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, the things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Verse 28, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Grass withers, flower fades, and the word of our God stands forever. So we're in our final week of this uh, little series we've been doing titled Missio Dei, Latin for the mission of God, his purpose and plan and our place in it. And we've been working through this for several weeks. We've covered uh, many different uh, realities about what God is doing and how he's doing it. And I've said that God's purpose has been to secure for himself a people who will glorify him and enjoy him. We are joy and glory multipliers. That was kind of our big idea from the first couple of weeks. What is God's plan? What is he doing? Seeing from way the beginning with Adam and Eve who were created and then commanded to go and be fruitful and multiply. We are to, God is securing, making for himself a people who will glorify him, make much of him, praise him, worship him, glorify him, and enjoy him, that those two things go together, and that as they glorify God and as they enjoy him, they then go out into the world and, and multiply. We are to be glory and joy multipliers. We trace that through the Old Testament, God working through certain individuals, just securing and building, creating this people for himself, uh, seen through Noah and through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down to David, and the prophets all pointing towards this people, and ultimately all culminating in the centerpiece that is Christ, right? Christ is the centerpiece of this purpose, he is the one, the one through whom God is securing these people for himself. All of mankind is in rebellion, in sin, transgression, under the wrath of God, separated from him, is in quite a predicament. We have no way to secure ourselves to God because we sit under his just wrath and our natural state. This is what Christ has done. Christ enters into time, real time, space, and history, puts on flesh, the second member of the Trinity, puts on flesh, and he lives the righteous life we all should have lived, dies the death that sinners deserve, so that everyone, repenting, confessing their sins, turning from them, and trusting Christ, can be forgiven of their sins, reconciled to God, securing them to himself. God does this work through Christ, giving the gift of faith, as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, giving the gift of faith so that these, this group, this people, is secured to him. And they glorify him because they know God has done this work. It hasn't been them. God has done it. So God is glorified, and they enjoy him because he's done this for them, that they might be forgiven of their sins, welcomed into eternal life. And, and joy with him. And so we are to then, that, that reality, God being glorified, us enjoying him, is to be multiplied. We, then we went on answering the question, okay, so if, if that was the centerpiece and Jesus has done that, then are we finished? What goes on next? And we went to the next reality is that that then glory and joy multiplying happens through the church. That God then, whatever he's doing in the world, he is doing through all of his people. 
What God is doing in, th- in and through and for the church, he's doing through the church. What God is doing for the church or for his people, he is doing through all of his people. We begin to recognize this emphasis that it wasn't just the, the spiritual elites who are somehow out uh, winning souls. It was the reality that every member, every person of the body of Christ is a minister, is out spreading this good news. Every individual in the church is for the church. Talking about, remember the imagery of uh, Paul uses of the body, that the ear can't say to the eye, I have no need of you, and how every part of the body of Christ is important. We, each one, is meant to be a, a, a member who God is moving through for the benefit of the church, each one of us. Whatever God is doing in the world, he is doing through each, through all of his people. We've been asking questions, we kind of start out, you know, what is God doing? What does God want in Mount Air? Trying to press on the question, do you think God is done moving in Mount Air? Further, what does God want at First Christian Church? Is God done moving at First Christian Church? Have we gotten to a comfortable place? You know, I was just talking with the guys this morning. I, it's crazy to think about. It. I've been here like three years and three months. And so we're just kind of cruising along and things are, you know, they just kind of the routine is working. And so is, are, are we there? You know, let's just, let's just cruise. Let's ride this thing out until Christ returns or we go home to glory. And is that where we are? Or does God, is God not yet finished? And I would argue that because since we are all still here, I don't think God is finished. I think God is doing something. The question is, what is that? If God is still at work, which I believe that he is, if we don't think God has done working in Ringgold County and our church, what then is he doing? And the hope, the desire out of this series is to reconnect us with the reality of what has God been doing from the beginning and securing ourselves to that mission. Not for us to get a big think tank, let's six of us get on a committee and we'll try to think up some new idea about what we should be about. No, let's think about what has God always been doing and how can we be a part of what he's doing in the world through our church right here, right now. What is this work then? What is it that God, we're saying that God is is uh, creating, wants us to be joy and glory multipliers. How then does this work? How does God work through the church to secure a people who will glorify him and enjoy him? And it is through the local church, the body of Christ. I, I believe God is working through his local church. The way he has set it up is the gathering of individual congregations who are seeking to glorify him and enjoy him, is the mechanism through which God moves into the world to bless the world. And there's three ways we're going to look at this this morning. The church exists to glorify, to serve God in worship, each other in nurture, and the world in witness. The church exists. How does this mission go forward through his church? It goes forward by the church existing to serve God in worship, each other in nurture, and the world in witness. Edmund Clowney gives this illustration in his book on the church. I'm going to read a little bit from his book on just titled The Church. It says this. He's given an illustration. Let us imagine that a pastoral search committee of Faith Community Church has adjourned its first meeting, having decided that they need to take two steps back in order to move forward. They agreed that faith church should have a mission statement. But there the, end meant, the agreement ended. John Goforth insisted that a mission statement is about mission and that the Great Commission makes evangelism the task of the church. Marion Schooler was not so sure. Her argument was that infants can't procreate and that a congregation with so many babes in Christ needs nurture before it can reduplicate and witness. James Pugh thought they both had it wrong. The church serves the Lord in worship, he said. Everything else leads to that, to the glory of his name. Readers or listeners who have served on such committees may find this piece of fiction familiar, 
but they may remember how similar discussions have broadened everyone's understanding of the understanding of the calling of the church. The church serves God directly in worship, but it also ministers to believers in nurture and to the world in witness. Each activity is part of Christ's charge. Each needs the other. So you, you understand the tension that he's bringing up. They're, they're going to write this. It's a fictional story, but you can imagine it. They get together. We're going to figure out, okay, we've got to figure out what is our church really about? And somebody's saying the church is about mission. It's about reaching out. It's about evangelism. It's about getting the lost into our doors. And somebody says, well, how can we reach out if we aren't healthy in and amongst ourselves? The main goal needs to be health among us. We've got to nurture ourselves. And then the third person comes along and says, well, the goal really isn't going out or, or building up. It's just worshiping God. And if we get the worship of God right, then all the rest of that will flow. And, they're, and they're, they're combating each other. But the reality is all of those things are what need to be going on in the local church. I think he's right. The church has to be more than just one thing. We proclaim one message, yes. But that message is the news of a Savior. The church calls people not to follow one system, but to follow one Savior. We do not beat the drum of a certain program, but the reality of a certain person. We're not just an institution going through forms. We don't just have programs. We lift up a person. We lift up a person. We do not promote empty ritual, but deep and meaningful relationship. This reality comes out in many different ways in the church, but I, I think these three categories are very helpful. First, we serve the Lord in worship. The corporate gathering is absolutely central to this truth, that when we get together, it is for worship. We have a Sunday morning worship service. And that, we get so, uh, I don't know, used to that term, worship service, or some now it's become, it's become uh, more popular in our modern times that we'll have uh, they'll have a worship section of the service. Like they'll have a, where, where, where the worship is the singing time or something like that. But the whole service is meant to be a gathering of worship. We are gathering to lift our voices and center our collective attention on a being, a real being, the infinite, eternal, holy, righteous God. That when we gather, it isn't just to, I don't know, pat each other on the back get self-help tips, feel better about ourselves. I mean, you know, all these certain things that people think church is about, get life tips. We gather in one very serious way to direct our attention towards God in worship. That when we sing hymns, the reason why we should make a joyful noise is because you realize that your singing is not for your neighbor. Your singing is not to try to impress somebody else. I mean, I stand up here, you see, I back as far away from the mic as I can because I don't want anybody to hear me sing. But the goal, the reality is I'm not singing for any of you. And if any of you are singing for me and your neighbor, you're missing the whole point. We gather for worship. That when we are in prayer, your attention isn't, isn't on, you know, what's going on around you. Or anything. It is, your attention is to be centered on God. Not in some formulaic way. Though there's nothing wrong with the repetitions that we have, the order that we have, but all that we do, we do should be in an effort to sing the praises of our God, to worship. There, there's a, I don't know if I, I can't do a good job of explaining the, the differences there of, because the motions can be exactly the same. And one person can be authentically in worship and one person just going through the motions. And what we are gathered for on a Sunday morning is honestly to worship, that we would lift high God. Worship always has an object. It always has an object. And when we gather, it is directed towards a personal being, towards God himself. Our times of prayer are to be focused on Him. Our singing is to be directed toward Him. Our reading of Scripture is to be worship. <laughs> that as you sit and listen to the Scriptures read, that is God speaking to us. It's to be worship that we sit and listen to the very words of our God. The preaching is to be a drawing out the meaning of the text to help us better hear and focus on Him, to be Godward in our orientation. 
Are you he what is the motivation underlying why you are here? Is it for someone else? Is it for some other intention or some other purpose or some sort of functionality or routine? Or, or is it because you want to gather together with the saints in corporate worship to lift high God's name? That Godward orientation should produce in us a reverence and awe for what we've gathered to do here. That's what the Hebrews passage is talking about. We should be grateful for a receiving of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We've, we've worked so hard in, in modern churches to make this as comfortable as we can for everyone, right? You know, you'll go to churches and they'll have coffee bars and we, you know, it's like you just, and we have, we have chairs now, not pews, not us. We still have pews, but lots of places have chairs. Pretty soon they're going to have recliners and they're going to have pillows and they're going to have, you know, you're going to have your mug is going to be there for you. And if you get bored, you can pop down the DVD player or something. And we want everyone to just be comfortable. And there's, and what's lost in that, and I'm not against, I'm not just trying to make you uncomfortable, but what's lost in that is a sense of we've gathered to do something very profound. We've gathered to do something very, just something that's awesome and not in the means of like a skater on a half pipe, but, but like watching a sunset. Is, we've gathered to do something awe-striking that we would lift our voices together to praise God, the creator of the universe. There's a sense of awe that should come from that. That when we gather, you know, we're, 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 we should be prayerfully gathering and meditatively gathering because what we are doing is gathering, gathering for something very large, impressive, expansive, huge. We are gathering to worship God. Why would he even bother to give us an ear? But he has created us and redeemed us out of our rebellion for this purpose that we might enjoy him and praise and glorify him. There's a sense of majesty that should wash over us as we seek to lift up our worship to the God of the universe. In a very basic way, all of creation shouts God's glory. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And you can go out and you can watch the sunset or the sunrise or look at the stars at night and the heavens just declare God's glory. But we are uniquely made as image bearers to praise God in a way that nothing else in creation can do. Angels long to look into our singing about redemption, the scriptures tell us. We have been given a special way to evoke as image bearers to worship God. We exist to serve God with the worship that he deserves. How does God's mission go forward of multiplying joy and glory, people? One of the ways is through the church existing to serve God in worship. That we gather together because we truly enjoy praising our God. We gather, we serve God. The church exists to serve God in worship. But secondly, we exist to serve each other in nurture. If you still have your Bibles out, you can flip to the book of Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3. So on page 1170 of your pew Bible, we gather, the church exists not just to worship God. That's what the, the guy with the last name Pew in the illustration. It also exists to serve each other and nurture. The way that we are joy and glory multipliers is, yes, gathering to worship God, but also gathering to serve one another in worship. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, Paul is speaking to the church what, how, how they are to exist with one another. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body, and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you or among you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. <laughs> teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here is a description of what the church is to be about with each other. 
The church is meant to be a place, yes, where God is worshipped, but also a refuge and a help for the Christian. The church is here to also serve the Christian. There's no denying that part of the design of God in bringing the church together is that we are here for the good of one another, that God gives gifts for the good of the church. We are here for the nurture of one another. None of us has it all together on our own. We each need each other. There are gifts that you have. There are gifts that you have, each individual person, that this church body needs. We are here to serve God in worship, but to serve each other in nurture. That is part of this mission going forward, glorifying God, worshiping together, but the church nurturing one another. That means that one way the church gets on board with God's mission to secure a people for himself is through our ministry to one another. Do you have any discipling relationships within this church? Do you have any discipling relationships within, within this church? I know there are lots of friend groups in this church. I know there are lots of people that just have been lifelong friends. But is there, are there discipleship, friendships, relationships in this church? It's a quite different question than if you have any friends in this church. But if I, if I could press on this here, I want us to seriously think about one of the ways that we are on God's mission in Mount Air is that we get better at nurture one for another within this local body. Who here needs the support of the local church? Who in this room needs the support of the local church? Every single one of us. Who, here, who is here to help give support to the local church? Every single one of us. And so I did this last week, but you look across the way this is built up, it makes everyone uncomfortable, but the way this is built up is for you. You can see everybody. <laughs> You can see everybody, and you look across, and you think, have I connected with that person? Am I interested in that person's discipleship? Am I interested in that person's growth with their walk with God? Maybe that person needs encouragement. Maybe that person's had a bad week, and they need somebody just a shoulder to cry on. Maybe they need somebody just to say, you know, I'm glad you're here. I, 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 I'm so thankful to see you sitting in the pew. Are we doing that? Who's going to be the ones to care for each one of us in this local body? Every single one of us. The church exists to worship God. The church exists to serve one another in worship. And thirdly, the church serves the world in witness. We have the best news in the world. Our message is a message of honesty about the human condition, why there is evil, why things are so hard, why the world is so ugly in so many different ways. We don't sell fake flowers, smell this. It's, it isn't life grand and some sort of deluded notion that things are magical when things are really hard and awful and hard at many times. We don't sell some fake notion of life. We face the shortcomings and sinfulness of our own self. We don't parade around, look how great we all are. We come to church confessing our sins. We are people that come to confess and receive we are honest about the human condition and about ourselves. We confess our desperate condition apart from God. And we go back in Colossians chapter 1, just to, to chapter 1, verse 27, 28. We, we confess this reality. And then 27, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul is talking about the glory that is shown in the Christian's life to the unbelieving world. And what do we proclaim? Him, Jesus Christ. We have the best message in the world. Proclaim him we must. The church exists to serve God in worship, absolutely. The church exists to serve one another in nurture, absolutely. And the church exists to serve the world in witness. We have a good news that people in this community, 80%, uh, 75% of which are not in a church on a Sunday morning because they have no connection to the thought of worshiping God with any real involvement in their life. They need to hear the good news of a God who has come to rescue them. They need to know a joy that they're out searching for in thousands of other ways, a joy that is only found in Jesus Christ. We exist 
to serve the world in witness. So the question remains, what does God then want to do here? We're press, I'm trying to press on this. And I think God is up to the same thing he's always been up to, to secure a people for himself. And the means through which he accomplishes this is, the, is through the same ones he accomplished it for. Practically how this plays out. Serve the world in witness. Do you have an unbelieving friend? Do you have loved ones that you know right now this morning are not in church? Do you know why? Do you have conversations with them about that? Engage them on this issue. Ask. You exist to serve the world in worship. The church exists to serve the world in witness. Look for inroads to the gospel with them. Here's a revolutionary idea. Pray for them. Are you praying for your unbelieving loved ones? Are you praying for your coworkers that don't know Jesus? Are you just praying? This Wednesday night, we're going to have prayer meeting here in the sanctuary. I encourage you, invite you to come out and to recommit to this reality. We are to be a witness to the world. And we're going to gather and we're going to put our loved ones, these people that we have that, are, that don't know Christ, to pray for them. And to pray for ourselves that we might be bold in our witness because this is how the mission of God goes forward, that we would serve the world in witness, praying for them. Serve the world in witness. Serve each other in nurture. Again, look around the room. Here we are. Inquire. Encourage. Support one another. Love enough to challenge them. If you see an area, maybe you look around the room and you think, that person's not here. And I know they want to be involved, and they aren't here. Love them enough to find out what's going on. If somebody misses months and months, you might think something's going on in their life. And maybe we should love them enough, and the nurture should be not shame, but is there something going on? Because I'm concerned. You're not gathering for worship. You're not obviously glad to be here. You're glad to be anywhere else. What's going on? Serve each other in nurture. Are you ever with others in this church family? Not, and not just those you naturally gravitate towards. Do you ever intentionally gather together for Christian discipleship and encouragement with those in this room? Right here. Do you gather for prayer meetings, Bible studies, maybe have people over, have people over for supper, something along those lines? Are we serving one another in nurture? The way the mission of God goes forward. Serving God in worship, serving each other in nurship and nurture, or serving the world in witness, serving each other in nurture, serving God in worship. Let's not play church. It's very tempting. It's an easy way to go to just show up and have our comfortable lives and, and routines. Don't play church. We have the chance right now, this morning, we're going to move into a time of communion. And you have a chance to play church and to go through the motions of communion. Or you have a chance to worship. You have a chance to honestly think about and, and direct your attention toward the God of the universe who has done such an amazing thing to rescue us by sending his son. Is your worship one of ceremony or is it, is it directed toward the one who rescues you? Let's serve him with worship, serving the world with witness, serving one another with nurture, and serving God with our worship as we direct our attention, thoughts, and hearts towards him. Let's pray. Father, assist us in this place this morning. Convict us. I pray, Father, you would shine the light in our pretenses, shine the light in our repetition and routine that is inauthentic and apathetic, that we would be quick to repent. God, I don't want to, I don't want to pretend up here this morning. I don't want to come to communion just out of it's the next thing I'm supposed to do. Father, we want to treasure you. You are the God who has made us. You are the God who, after we fell and ran away from you, made a way to redeem us and secured us to yourself through your work of the work of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, may we come in humility, confessing, rejoicing, and worshiping truly who you are through the grace and mercy of your son, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we pray in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.